Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon. I'm your host and your guide. And as you know, my job is to help you get off the brink. How do I do that? I want you to see things through a fresh lens. I want you to feel them differently. I want you to think about them, but you have to see them and feel them to think about them and then you can change. So I go looking for people who can help you do just that. I don't have to be the only one. So today I have Veronica Sakustumi from California. And as you know, I go global. So it's not Australia today or New Zealand is California, but it's still a wonderful place to be. And Veronica and I are gonna talk about how to help you as you're going through this post pandemic period that you're facing. And I'm timing this for the post pandemic because I don't know when that is. I don't know what a new normal is, but I do know I used to tell people, if you want to change, have a crisis or create one. Mm -hmm. I didn't expect this crisis, but I also know that I have clients coming in from everywhere who don't know what do I do? How do I recreate a viable business in a new world, which may or may not be in person? And so, Veronica, thank you for joining me. Oh, Andy, it's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Well, I'm so happy you are too. Tell the listener about who is Veronica, about your own journey. That story is an important one. And then we'll get into what are you doing for helping people? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, you know, I feel like I, my, my original trajectory to this was like many others, meaning I went to school, got a college degree and started pursuing the climb of that corporate ladder that we're taught in school, you know, to get a, go get a job and start getting the promotion and go for that ultimate goal of having the corner office. And so I got busy doing that. I am so lucky that I am in the middle of San Francisco. I am between San Francisco and the Silicon Valley. So early, early on, I got a niche for myself. You know, I carved out that um, I wanted to go work for technology, e-commerce and software type of companies. And I was in the perfect place to do that. So I got busy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, uh, geography was on my on my side for sure. And so I did that. I started to work with companies that were either I didn't know what an IPO was at the time. Right out of college, you don't know what IPO. It's that initial public offering. And I think that knowing served me well because had I known what I was getting myself into, <laughs> I don't know if I would have done it. You know, how does that, how does that job go? You're just like, you're not going to sleep very much. You're going to be stressed out 24 seven. It's going to be a roller coaster ride. You're going to love, love and hate every minute of it. <laughs> you know, that wasn't the pitch at all. But anyway, I, I found myself loving the fast pace in a way. I think I've always had that entrepreneurial spirit since I was a little kid anyway. Um, that's a different story of, you know, trying to sell my, you know, perfumed uh, flowers to my family when I was nine. But I felt like that working in the Silicon Valley and in the San Francisco Bay Area for those startup companies and going through those, whether it's an IPO or a merger acquisition, what a great training ground because it really fulfilled that entrepreneurial spirit that I've had in me all along. Um, and yeah, through being very aggressive with my career, I definitely found myself volunteering for those system conversions and whatever they needed to be part of that special team to go to the next level. I was constantly raising my hand, which got me noticed. It got me a great reputation of being, uh, getting things done, having a strong work ethic and being very out of the box thinker, all those things that, you know, you get to um, just leverage when you're in a startup company because you gotta be fluid and you gotta be like creative and you gotta pivot very quickly. I didn't know then how it would serve me many, many, many years later in my own business and uh, pivoting within my niche. And so, yeah, I got to be, you know, have those uh, titles of controller, vice president of finance, vice president of finance and, and operations, CL chief operating officer and chief financial officer. And I found myself in the corner office in San Francisco with a financial services company where we married very traditional financial services with technology, my love. And so it was like, <laughs> what a dream come true, right? And, you know, working with a beautiful team, um, we're, fr we're friends for life. We, we still see each other and get together many years later after we stopped working together. But, you know, you go through things together and you find uh, uh, something that you love. Like they say, oh, if you find something you love, you'll never work a day in your life. That's not true. You still work. <laughs> But you have a passion and a purpose. And I do think that's very important. Yeah, yeah. a so, passion and purpose and, and to do it with people that you actually like 
and respect, that's just a dream, right? The corner office. You know, I'm listening to you because you didn't really have a destination. You had a journey going on, didn't you? Mm -hmm. I did. But I it did. excited you the whole way up. Exactly. And the, the part of the what fueled that journey was not only my own ambition to, to be good, to be great, to constantly strive. Um, I'm an avid reader and, and learner. I'm constantly taking classes um, for personal growth, for professional growth, for even arts and crafts, <laughs> but I'm always taking classes. Hey, why not? Right? I, I, I realized that part of the journey was to also, you know, kind of like be open to, to change, be open to opportunity and to also learn from the failures that we in the Silicon Valley, I would say we would have the saying, it still goes on now, which is like fail fast and mm -hmm. fail often. Yeah. because we learn so much from that so that we can get to the next iteration. And I often felt that way for myself. It's like, how do I continue to be the better, the next iteration of myself is through learning, growing, changing, pivoting, or just being open to be, being coachable. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing. So yeah, so I found myself in that corner office for quite a few years. And like many people, they find themselves either, what's next, you know, what's my next thing? For myself, I had a life event that involved my grandmother, mm -hmm. my grandmother who raised me. I called her my original life coach. Um, she continues to give me lessons, even though I, I did lose her a few years back. But my grandmother hurt herself, meaning she, she broke her ankle. And she was in her early 90s in San Francisco, living on her own, very independent, you know. And so she needed to go and have surgery and go to a rehabilitation center um, facility, not center facility. And she and I were very, very close. I will tell you, every, she, everybody says I was her favorite. They were their favorite, her favorite. I was the favorite. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I found myself in that fork in the road where I was full of guilt constantly. I needed to be with her when I was with her. I wasn't with my team. When I wasn't with my team, I was wanting to be with her. And by the time I drove home to my own home life, I was showing up as the worst version of myself because I was on empty. Mm -hmm. And during that time, I think we all have that moment in our career or in our lifetime where we have to make a decision. Yep. And that decision for me was, I, I just, I'm so grateful that I have this, that I had the self-awareness at that moment to realize that I wasn't going to have my grandmother forever. Yeah. And that I did not want to have the regret of choosing my career over her. Yes. And so I really had to think about what do I need to do so that I can not have regrets and, and be able to live with whatever decisions that I'm making. And at the time, I thought that resigning was going to be the best option. Um, and speaking to the CEO, I didn't quite resign right away. I had a transition. Um, he tried to keep me on many different ways, but ultimately I felt like I needed to, in order for me to really be there for my grandmother, I needed to not be the, the chief financial officer of this company because without a corner office, yes, you get perks and compensation and it's so fun to be a decision maker that really makes an impact on the business and your clients' lives. But th th there's a lot of pressure. Yeah. There's a lot of, uh, there's sleepless nights. There's no holidays, no weekends because at that time I didn't have a balance in my life. Yes. And so I didn't feel like I could do both. I felt like I needed to make a decision and the decision that I made was to, start my own consulting business. And while that's not an easy piece, at least I knew that I would have flexibility that I needed in order to be present with my grandmother. And it, that is the best decision I made. It's interesting because I, though I'm working individually as a coach with somebody or with a company that has to change. Mm -hmm. And then I chatted a little bit about this. I used to say that if you want to change, have a crisis or create one. Because mm -hmm. if not, um, if your grandmother did not have her unfortunate accident, you might still be in that corner office. Mm -hmm. And there may have been lots of tension and sleepless nights, but no catalyst, no aha moment. Maybe well, I'm working with a dozen women now as, in a, as a coach, executive coach. Um, and each one of them came unhappy. Didn't matter where they were. They were CPAs, MBAs, CEOs, entrepreneurs, um, the heads of um, successful in that word successful, um, mm -hmm. but not happy. They had forgotten what their purpose was. 
And they also had forgotten that life is just not a title in an office. Sounds like that's what your grandmother's gift to you. I'll share one more story and then we'll go back to yours. Yeah. I was no, going to yeah. name my, my, my new book, Rethink, Smashing the Myths of Women in Business. My new book was going to be called What I Learned at My Grandmother's Knee. And I had a wonderful grandmother who I adored, who had the family firm. And what I learned from the time I was a little, little kid at her knee was what I wanted to share. It may be another book. But to your point, if we are listening and open and feel and see, we can begin to come to new decisions that are really good. So let's talk about the next phase in your life. This is very exciting, the consulting phase. It, the consulting phase was one where I just kind of thought I had to talk to myself, you know, those words, the, the inner words that we use to speak to ourselves, right? And, and kind of go through the process of like, I've helped all these companies mm -hmm. to not only grow, but scale to massive success. Why can't I do that for myself? Yes. And that a question of like, why can't I do that for myself started to evolve into, I can do that for myself. Yes. And the very first thing, I'm a planner. I'm, a, I'm not a wing it person. I'm a planner. <laughs> so, <laughs> for better or worse. It's for okay. better or worse. <laughs> exactly. And uh, combine the planner with the accounting background goodness gracious you know <laughs> I, I wasn't going to just quit my job and go do this I it was between making the decision to resign and start my own consulting business it was about six months and during that six months it was me looking at my my relationships inside of my network and that's one of those things that I want to share with um with your audience is that our don't let's not look at our network as just these you know, names yeah. or titles. That's they right. are relationships. Yeah. There are different types of relationships, people we worked with, people we worked for, uh, people we met at a conference, at a, at a workshop. There's just so many events, especially if we've been around in corporate America for a while. And at that time I had for 20 years, I had a yes. 20 year corporate career that I had accumulated um, business cards <laughs> right email addresses uh phone numbers and so i got busy sort of going through it and identifying yes. you know who were the people that i wanted to not just restart but reignite that relationship with and i had the time i i didn't want to come out of left field and be like i'm starting a business how can i help you <laughs> wrong tactic I, I i have a resource that's called just that nurture your network yes. which is talking about reigniting the relationship and so that's what I did. I started to reach out to people genuinely, you know, saying, how are you? It's been a while. You know, what are you up to? Are you still with this company? Just curiosity, Re you know, like that, in that initial contact, whether it was an email, a text, a voicemail through WhatsApp, you know, technology is so amazing these days. There are so many ways I can reach out. Um, I even started doing uh, on LinkedIn in your mobile device, you can leave voice messages. For, for your context as opposed to just the text one. And I have yet to have somebody not respond to those because people are curious <laughs> and they hear your voice. So yeah, I started to um, reach out. And so when I was ready to say, hey, I'm starting my CFO consulting business. And I don't know if you were aware of that, you know, just like wanted to let you know in case you're interested or know somebody who could, you know, use my services, here's what I'm focusing on. So by the time I sent that email, it was like maybe three, four, five emails after that initial one, where it had been an organic conversation without any like, get back to me by this Friday. No, it was more of like, hey, how are you doing to what are you up to? What's going on in your life? What's going on in your business? What's going on with work? Hey, here's an article that I saw that you might be interested in to then me announcing that I was going on my own. My first, second and third consulting clients came from inside of my network. Yeah. So that's what started that. And of course, very quickly uh, was able to be not, I don't want to say full time because I, I, everybody knew my priority was my grandmother. Yes. And so we worked around that and I was building the consulting business. I was able to hire contractors to help me before I knew it. I had been building an agency, which by the way, I still run today. I have help. I don't have a website. Everything was through LinkedIn, word of mouth, a referral for, through that reputation. Um, 10 years later, it's still going on. It's still going strong, but it's with, you know, just again, people who can speak to my reputation and the relationship that we have had for a really long time. Veronica, your strategy, remember the book, Never Eat Alone, came out much yes. years ago. 
mm -hmm. hard to be alone today, but but I, I used it all the time to tell people, you want to grow your business? You're not a soloist, you need an orchestra. And treat them as they're each playing a different role in your metaphor, but that's what I visualize. It's, it's mm -hmm. really important. And it's interesting because your strategy is built around LinkedIn. Ours has been built around a search engine optimization content marketing. And while I have 10,000 plus Twitter followers and they are a fascinating group who come to our website in the numbers, and I have 10,000 LinkedIn friends and family, um, I haven't quite figured out LinkedIn, another conversation, um, but everyone has a different strategy. So I pick up clients because the keywords come up, they go Google, and there I am on the front page of Blue Ocean Strategy Expert, Culture Change Expert, and, and I'm happily picking up clients today around that. It's an interesting world because whatever, it's hard to know what works and it's hard to know each one of them is different. If you want to share a little on that, that would be great. But I don't want to interrupt the conversation about how do you go from consulting as a chief financial officer? I want to stay focused on the problems that you like to solve. Our job mm -hmm. is to get our folks off the brink. Mm -hmm. I have a hunch you're doing that. So we can come mm -hmm. back to LinkedIn, but talk to mm -hmm. them about how do you get them off the brink so they can soar again? Because I think that's what your role is. Exactly. So the, the consulting practice, you know, kind of what many consultants will will encounter is that limitation of trading hours for dollars. Mm -hmm. I was not an exception to that. I quickly realized I had built a business where I had not one boss, but seven, eight, <laughs> every client had similar deadlines. And I'm like, oh my God, I what have I done? So I quickly got busy re restructuring that so that I could you know, set some boundaries around that. But then I also realized um, around 2015, I realized that there were a lot of corporate executives who wanted to leave corporate America like I had done and would reach out to me as I became a consultant, you know, was, you know, either consulting for their business or somebody that they had referred me to, they would often ask me, hey, what if I was thinking of doing this? How would I go about it? And that I just kind of created a solution for those questions that were being asked of me over and over again. They saw sort of like my lifestyle. It's like, I want to do that. <laughs> Part of that, right? Part of that was like, uh, be me being really honest, but I, what I did is I created a framework to help corporate professionals start their own consulting practice. And that went on for quite a few years of sort of, you know, going through the process of identifying who, you know, your niche and what service do you want to offer and well, making the question. transition. Yeah. And also uh, well, there was one thing that I don't see a lot of people talking about is you have to have such a mind shift to go from an employee, especially somebody who's been a decision maker at a corporation. You're the big, the big wig making all these decisions. And then you become a consultant and they, your client may not implement anything that you're recommending. Right. So there's some mind shift and you almost have to mourn that person that you're giving up that identity as a corporate executive or manager or a, just a corporate professional into this entrepreneur consultant that you are now going to identify with and build. And so for many years, I did that. Stay on that thought for a moment, because my husband's mm -hmm. a serial entrepreneur. And when he sold his business in 2017, he joined mine. Now he was the CEO, the founder and CEO, he grew to the fifth largest in the company. And then he's joining mm -hmm. mine. And I said, and the press release is successful husband sells his business and joins his wife's really, um, you're my partner. Yes. Um, but his biggest frustration is not being in charge. And, and it's not even in charge of our company, but when he goes to consult, it's a, a mind shift that I've had to work hard with him on uh, because his job is to enable, facilitate, consult, mentor, suggest, and help them come to that conclusion themselves. That's a whole different person than the one who was in charge of 2,500 people and you know $100 million of contracts and all the rest. Um, and uh, entrepreneurs may have a difficult time, but the corporate folks will as well. It's a different mm -hmm. person, you know, different persona. So it sounds like this is part of your, oh, let me tell you about your mindset. Yeah, exactly. It's because part of knowing it's identifying that it's going to happen. At some point, it will happen. You need to be aware of it, be prepared of how to navigate through it. So that's part of, that was part of the, the process of, you know, transitioning from corporate professional to consultant. It sounds like you know it well, your yes. husband is experiencing it. it. It's no joke. It's real. And it can really play with 
maybe your ego, your, what am I doing? What did I do? And so people who want to go into consulting, I would often counsel them as to how are you going to, how would it you feel when this happens? How, and this is how we're going to tackle it. And an interesting thing happened in early 2020. Obviously we went into this pandemic mode that no one could have seen. Well, my partner is a scientist and he was like, we, a lot of us could saw and we wanted to prepare, but we, there was a lot of stumbling blocks along the way. But for us, you know, the, the everyday person, we didn't, we could have never planned for this. We went into 2020 with the best of intentions with our goal setting and our planners and our calendars and right. May 16th, March 16th for us. Yeah. Yeah. Right. March 16th hit and everybody was sent home. And that's when my, my uh, ultimate pivot in 2020 started uh, that day because I went into the mode of, I had been helping corporate professionals to strategize on how to start their consulting business, how to take their experience, their knowledge, all their skill set, and transition. Then all of a sudden the pandemic hit and everybody was sent home. And I got busy for the next three days after March 16th, I probably created 27 little videos, Loom videos. I use Loom um, as to how to set up your home office, the technology that you need, free resources, how to stay connected, the how to, how to, how to, because I knew this was something I knew how to do. Yes. I knew that I could share those videos with the corporate CEOs, with the professionals that still had the job, with people who were like losing their jobs within the next few weeks, how to turn. I mean, I just got busy. No one paid me. No one told me to do it. I just saw, I know how to do this. Let me go and do this and, and share it with everybody as quickly as possible. Perfection was not the goal. <laughs> Beautiful was not the goal. It was like effective, uh, relevant, yep. fast, and with a calmness. Yes. I had to be calm and be like, you're going to be okay. I, I don't even know how many videos I'm like, don't worry about it. I'm going to show you. I would, sh I would film myself how to set it up, how to hook things up. And that just gave me a lot of goodwill because you know what happened, Andy? I was top of mind for so many people Yes. on different areas, whether it was my consulting practice where people were like, I can't believe, thank you so much. And no, no charge. How much do I owe you? Nothing. This was just, we're in, we're in it together. Let's just go through it. And then a funny thing happened. A lot of people, not funny, like funny, haha. -ha, funny, like people started to get laid off or they started to fear getting laid off. And so there was a lot of like, what am I going to do? Can you help me? And so that started to answer a different question. On the other side, Andy, were all of these other CPA firms, accounting firms, bookkeeping, tax services, law, lawyers, like, how am I going to run my business? How am I going to sustain? Never mind grow. How am I going to sustain my business? And so that I started to think about how will I serve that audience to, for, to show them that there's this whole online, you know, platform that they can use not only to sustain, but to actually grow, to have a, you know, greater reach and a deeper impact. They just have to show up in a different way. And that required them to think differently and be open to trying new things, even if it wasn't going to be mean that they were going to be the expert in it or that they were going to know how to do it from day one and be perfect. They needed to let go. Is there a case, an illustrative one that you might share? It often yes. helps the listeners take what you're doing and say, wow, that's really cool. Really? Who mm -hmm. did that? And how did they do it? I have um, a client who is a, has a full tax practice not only by himself but he has hired other tax preparers but everything is and or was an in-person <laughs> an in-person business like I mean it's so many tax preparers will hear this like yeah well yeah how else do you do it well you have so many technology um, resources that you can tap into and so for this particular client who also uh, you know I know him from the, he's a CPA he, not all the tax preparers are certified public accountants, but you know, they all work for him. It's his business. Um, and when I met with him the first time, you know, he was in a panic. It was like overnight, I've lost, I've lost my, my business. I said, no, oh. you haven't lost your business. You just need to do your business a little differently. And so there was a lot of fear with the, those initial conversations. And there was a lot of resistance to, well, yeah. that I don't, that's not how I do it. 
no. Don't if you, you love those words? No, that's not the way it's done. Yeah, no, that's not the way it's done. No, can't figure out how to do it. Right? We could probably fill quite a few pages of all those <laughs> phrases. But quite a few people who really got stalled or stuck. Yeah. And so they need to have a growth mindset that says, of course I can. Yeah. So how'd you help him? So I showed him. I, you know, it's like you, you, you talk about in your podcast, you know, with the other guests, you know, Andy, that you, people need to see it. Yes. And so the, the very first thing I did was I sent him a link on how to schedule something just by using, I use Acuity Scheduling. Yep. My Zoom link is integrated with it. There is a payment processor. So I showed him how it's done and how automatic it's done. I go, you don't need your receptionist, though, all the back and forth. And yep. the, so every step of the way I showed him, and this is how your client would book. And this is how you would deliver. This is how you would gather the documents securely. I'm sorry. This is how you, <laughs> yeah, I know you're, we're both laughing because we know it's, that's what we do. It's second nature, but there's this whole sector of people out there who are used to doing business a certain way. Yeah. And so the resistance started to slowly, it took about three weeks to, for him to realize, oh, I can yeah, I can do this. Now the most interesting part, I mean, I have a client and they put 75 accounting firm, 75 of them all went remote and they had just finished opening a new corporate office and they're not quite sure who's going to come back. And my healthcare client is a little different because, but we couldn't bring telemedicine in for 10 years. I had a healthcare client in a weekend, we brought it in. In a week, the doctors were all enjoying it um, and they don't know if they want to go back to the mm -hmm. challenge is how do you tell someone they have cancer telemedicine style? I'm not sure that's that different than telling them in person. It's, mm -hmm. And then we had a college client and he's had his best year ever financially, all remote. He said, and I can now go global with my programs and my nursing mm -hmm. program is going great and I don't need a facility. So now the question is, wow, we've learned to adapt. We're mm -hmm. humans. We've evolved and our brains now have new skills in it and a new mm -hmm. mindset. You know, I talk about that because you can collaborate with your mind and what you never did before, you know, we don't do that. Well, really? Why not? Well, we don't do that. Mm -hmm. but why? <laughs> Let's give it a shot. Yeah. And next thing you exactly. know, oh, I can do this. It's such an interesting time. Mm -hmm. How about turning lemons into lemonade or limes to margaritas? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's been one of the, I, I don't want to call it a gift, but it's been so wonderful to see people now being so much more open to this online practice. My clients started to realize the, the corporate ones that, you know, were used to seeing me in person a few times a month. They now realize they have more access to me. That's right. They, it does, we haven't missed a beat. We can actually collaborate on things so much faster and sooner I can, you know, we're on Zoom. We can uh, share a screen and get an answer right away or train. Yeah. You know, I create so many videos for trainings. They start to see the opportunity yep. for showing up online and, and scaling their business because now they're not limited by geography. Not only not limited by geography for clients, but also for talent that they can hire. To anyway. deliver the service to their clients. No, and the client doesn't care where they are. No. I, no. And, and this idea, you know, there were a, a third of the U.S. workforce before this were in the gig economy. And they lived happily ever after, as long as there were jobs. Um, now there are another three million who are in the gig. But I also think there are a whole lot of furloughed and without jobs. The mm -hmm. trick now is to really think about um, creativity, curiosity, Mm -hmm. thinking it's so it's not hard the fourth industrial revolution was on the cusp of opening up the door and all these tools are here and yeah. so you know it's it's an interesting exciting time and i say this gently except for the gray hairs and the no hairs um every one of my clients who has an older board member or staff member who just can't see how needs a special mentor Sometimes I have the younger Gen Ys mentor the boomers mm -hmm. um, because they need another language and they want to believe that you can, but it's like golf. You know, if you don't swing the club 749 times and hit the ball, you'll never play. You can't learn from a book, but you got to do yeah. it. And then all of a sudden mm -hmm. it comes together slowly, um, mm -hmm. but it's fun. Veronica, we're just about out of our half hour as much as I'm enjoying myself. That went by audience, so fast. It does go fast, but it is fun. But our audience likes a couple of things to remember. So share with them one or two or three things you don't want them to forget because they always remember the end even better than the beginning. And this has been a great conversation. A couple of things. I, I, one of the primary things that comes to mind right away is about you know, purpose. You know, having that clarity of purpose 
is what's going to get you to show up in a different way. Because if you can think about who is it that you're showing up for, who needs to hear that thing that you want to share, whether it's a tip, a tactical thing, a strategy, a uh, best practice, or just your thought, you know, for those thought leaders, it's like, who are you getting up for in the morning that needs to hear your message? If you can put the focus on that recipient, then you're not going to care so much about what you look like, what you sound like. Oh right. my gosh, you know, stop putting the focus on yourself and show up for the person who needs to hear from you today. Yep. That's the first thing. And, and the I second one, I, said, I think about it outside in, not inside out. Mm -hmm. Forget the factory. It's not what you make. It's what do they need? And where mm -hmm. are they? And your purpose word keeps coming up. I've had three podcasts today and everyone is focused on purpose, purpose led life, purpose in your job. Yes. So mm -hmm. the first one is your purpose. Mm -hmm. The second one's not even tactical. It's the mindset. You know, your words and your thoughts matter. Yeah. We know that wherever you're, you know, how you speak to yourself, your beliefs that are going inside your mind, that dialogue, that it's constant. What is that saying? New level, new devil. You know, if you think, oh, well, once I make this much money, you know, I'll be happy. Or once I lose this many weight, or that's much weight, I'll feel this. No, it's the journey, but it's also learn to speak to yourself in a kind, purposeful way, your words, your thoughts matter because that's where your that's where your focus will go. And what you focus on is what you get, what you attract. So we're never done working on our mindset, by the way. It's like an ever, I think it's a lifelong journey to constantly be, you know, checking ourselves. And I, I like to think of it as a toolbox that we're constantly thinking about or look learning new ways to deal yeah. with whatever comes next. And what tool do I have in my toolbox? to be able to get through that moment in that thought or that those words, um, shut that mean girl down. I have a, a, you know, I've named my mean girl and whenever she starts to creep up, I tell her to just <laughs> be quiet. It's <laughs> funny, our metaphors are all interesting. I think of it as a movie. You have mm -hmm. a story in your head and that movie plays, it'll play the same thing over and over again, unless you change the script in the movie mm -hmm. and we live our stories, that becomes who we are. It's not an outside, it's who we are. And it's not working anymore. So you can keep it, um, but why? Nobody's keeping that story in your head except you. So collaborate with your mind, craft a new exactly. story. If you imagine it and believe it, you can act on it. And you'd be amazed that all of a sudden, what happened to Veronica was she imagined herself free of the corner of office and all the responsibilities. You don't have less responsibility now, but they're different. And you created a world that could fit for you where you were then. I have a hunch you have another couple coming over life. And I, you know, with writing my books and so forth and developing my program, um, that's sort of the next part of my journey. But the journey doesn't end. It's not a destination. It's exciting to move along and have fun. Be curious. That's cool. If they want to reach you, where can they get a hold of you? My home base is my website, veronicasagastinley.com. That's where I'm, I plan on sharing quite a few things coming up in 2021. And uh, yeah, if you go there, please say hello. There's a contact section and uh, drop me a line. I read every single one. I respond to every single one. So come on over and grab your resources. They're free and say hello. Are you also on LinkedIn, I bet? I am also on LinkedIn, yes. Veronica, I think it's Veronica Sagas to me. Good. I, I say that because sometimes there's a middle initial if there was another one taken. If believe it or not, there is another Veronica Sagastumi out there. Well, I can believe anything. So, but that's cool. I, I say that only because you started by saying you built a lot of your oh, business yes. on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. And it's yeah. a very powerful way, it's a big directory of who is the talent that you need. So we are exactly. Well. So I'm gonna wrap. It's been such fun. I'm going to pull up my book and say it is now time to promote my new book, Rethink Smashing the Myths of Women in Business. And as you know, I wrote that because uh, my husband and I launched the Simon Initiative for Entrepreneurship at Washington University in St. Louis. And like you, we wanted to help entrepreneurs become the best they could be. What we found were that women were really looking for role models. So I started to write a book on role models. And then my husband came up and he said, he's listening to them. He says, you know, they're smashing the myths of women in business. I went, oh, that's a better book. So I rewrote the book and it, just, it was just published in January, 2021 and it is doing gangbusters. The interesting part is that the women in there each smashed a myth holding them back. A little like Veronica might have. She didn't ask whether she was capable of being in the IPOs or in Silicon Valley. She just charged ahead. She smashed the myths of what women can do. 
And then she helps others even smash their own myths because this is all mind matter. And you know, it's how do you manage your mind so that you can become the best you can be? And now I'm having a program come out March 1st called Rethink Your Journey with Andy Simon is to help women do just that. And we've done some research, it's a disturbing number, but 60% of the women answering the research said they were not happy with their life today. And as I work with the women I'm coaching, they're not happy yet either. That purpose that you talked about is missing. And so the question is, how do we find your purpose and then help you live it? And so there's lots of work to be done. So for those of you who come, I can't thank you enough for joining our podcast. Veronica said she's a fan. I've got about a hundred and some odd thousand who come every month and I, I work hard to make it a value to you. My job is to get you off the brink so you can soar. And I hope you're soaring today. Veronica, you can um, uh, meet on her website or on LinkedIn. She might help you get the tools you need to become the best you want to be. And it's always fun to do that. Don't forget to send me your emails at info at andysimon.com. And you can actually download a free chapter of the book at andysimon.com. Join our Facebook group, uh, Rethink with Andy Simon. Bunch of women who come together all the time, but once a month we have a round table. You're welcome to join us, Veronica. And it's fun. To. It's it's um, actually it's noon. I think we're doing it on the 15th, but I have to check. Um, but it's uh, it is no. Yep. February, uh, January 18th. But I'll get the, the date for you. But but, you know, we thought it was a great platform for women who are all alone to come together and talk to each other. It's a little give and get. What do I need? What can I help you with? And they're all smart ladies, they're all smart. <laughs> Women are so smart today. So on that note, I'm gonna say goodbye to everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you for supporting us. Share away, buy my book, review it and have fun. Goodbye.